This pit's just about coming to the end of its useful life. They're mining out the last few tons of lead zinc ore. And yet mining only began here about eight months ago. At any one time, on the Pine Point property, there are several pits in operation. But they've only got a lifetime of about six months to two years. And so that means in order to keep a supply of ore steadily going to the mill, that new discoveries have to be made, new pits have to be brought into production at a rate of about one a year. When you find a new ore body, you don't just start digging it out of the ground straight away. In this pit, for instance, it took about five years from discovery to the start of actual mining. So a whole lot of complex planning and preparation has to go on before the first ore truck leaves a new pit. When the geophysical and geological teams have found an ore body and have defined to us the extent of the mineralization, they then provide us with a geologic reserve plan. The first step for us on the engineering side is to determine whether or not any of this is worth mining. The geologic reserve can take a number of different forms. The first map that is given to us is a drill hole composite showing all of the drill holes in the mineralized area with the lead, zinc, and iron grade. We then translate that drill hole composite into a three-dimensional block model. These blocks are in the order of 16 by 16 meters with a thickness of approximately four meters, the same as the average mining height. This is one slice of that block model. In each block is an estimate of the ore tonnage, the ore grade, lead and zinc, and also the waste tonnage. This block model can also be represented in a number of different forms. In this case, a probability contour of 0.7 tells us that any blocks occurring between 0.7 and 0.6 that 70% of that block would be ore of a particular grade and 30% would be waste. In order to determine where the pit is going to be, we cut sections through this model. And this can be shown in this illustration. This diagram illustrates a section through our profit loss model showing a break even line, which will be the line of the pit. A typical section such as this, will show the negative waste blocks on top with the ore blocks underneath. The sum total of the values in all of these ore blocks has to be equal to or greater than everything above it. We mine at the top down to the bottom to get at this ore. For example, you'll see here on the right-hand side that to mine an additional block, such as these two here, we would have to push the pit back to this line here. Obviously, the cost of mining these blocks is more than the value of these two ore blocks being left in the ground. We've seen four items so far that have gone into this economic evaluation. The cost of mining, the grade of the ore, the depth of the ore, which will affect the strip ratio, and of course, the metal prices. We have no control over the grade and the depth of the ore deposits. Mother Nature takes care of that. And supply and supply and demand takes care of the metal price. The only factor we can influence at all is the cost of mining. So let's have a look at some of the costs which go into the development of this pit. First of all, we have to clear the trees from around the pit area and waste dumps. An average pit and dump area may require up to 500 hectares of clearing. Now, unfortunately, most of the ore bodies are found below the natural water table. We obviously can't mine underwater, especially if it's minus 40 degrees Celsius. So we have to dewater the area that we're going to mine. And we do this by drilling large diameter wells around the perimeter of the pit, install large pumps, and start pumping. The trick is to depress the water table below the next bench to be mined. Ditches must be built to drain the water away from the pit area. And some of these are over five kilometers in length. While the dewatering is taking place, we have to construct hole roads, hopefully with waste rock from a nearby pit. Some of our hole roads are well over 20 kilometers in length. 
Once the whole roads are in place, the stripping work can begin. Overburden and waste dumps must be located so that we don't end up dumping over a future pit. All in all, several years of planning and preparation work is required before all production can begin. Bush that's been here since the last ice age is bulldozed flat. The timber is burnt and access roads are laid to allow heavy equipment to be moved into the mine site. Locally, this natural habitat, previously untouched by man, is completely destroyed. But not all of the wildlife retreats into the wilderness around the mine site. A few individuals benefit from scraps tossed out at meal breaks because they've learned not to be afraid of either machines or men. After bush clearance, water is the next big problem. Lowering the water table to below the ore zone requires pumping on a vast scale. A complex of boreholes around the site are pumped, not only before mining, but throughout the life of any pit, because the rocks below here are very permeable. Millions of gallons a day are brought to the surface and led away along drainage ditches, which are cut into the impermeable boulder clay. All the water drains away from the main drainage ditch that surrounds the mine site, and it goes into the Great Slave Lake. It takes months of pumping before mining can begin. Overburden first. The thick blanket of boulder clay and alluvium needs no blasting and is excavated by drag line or electric shovel. A tracked electric shovel is a mainstay of modern mining, being much more manoeuvrable than earlier rail-mounted types, and now extremely large. Size reduces costs in muck shifting. Forty tons a bucket full, and just five buckets to a truckload. There are fifty or so of these two hundred ton diesel electric trucks on the pump. You can see that the cost of developing and preparing an ore body for production are tremendous. Unless the value of the ore in the ground is sufficiently high to cover these costs, as well as satisfy the shareholders, then the ore will stay in the ground. However, if the combination of grade, price, and depth is right, then we'll mine it. The object of blasting is merely to break the rock. The 70 tons of explosive fired here have reduced the ore to manageable lumps. Shovels and trucks do the rest. These machines are matched for size, and here the largest types available shift thousands of tons every day. Bench height is determined by the size of the shovels, and the gradient of the ramp is designed for optimum haulage rates. As the ore is followed downwards, a cycle of shoveling and loading clears the ore from a particular bench. And new benches are drilled, ready for firing. These rigs drill shot holes, which are later filled with explosives. The drill bits are studded with carborundum and can cut rapidly through the relatively soft limestone rock. The chippings produced by the drilling provide additional samples of ore, 
to enable more accurate estimates of all grade to be made for each bench. That's because the shot holes are much more closely spaced than the exploration bore holes. Drilling, firing, loading. The cycle continues until the ore has gone. Such is the investment in machinery that maintenance is a major cost of the operation. Keeping trucks like this moving needs a large, skilled workforce that has to be on call at all times in all weathers. Pine Point is a thousand kilometers from the nearest city, so many millions of dollars worth of stores are necessary under very strict stock control. Spares of every conceivable item needed for the mine are kept here. The whole operation would grind to a halt if a simple $10 mill bearing failed and was not in stock. Open pit mining is very simple in principle. The object is to shift a lot of material as cheaply as possible. And the trend in open pit mining is towards the use of ever larger and more reliable machines. So that ore leaves the mine 24 hours a day, every day of the year. Pine Point, an added complication, is that there's not just one big hole in the ground, but several pits, which are as much as 20 kilometers apart or more. Mining must be continuous, and the vehicles must keep moving, whatever the weather. Otherwise, this huge investment won't pay off. hundreds of men and women working at Pine Point, there's one principal objective. To ensure a constant supply of ore to the mill. At the mill, the object is to separate the ore minerals from the waste or gang by physical and chemical means. This is the primary crusher. It's a cone crusher and it reduces the ore to the size of small boulders. Stubbornly large lumps are helped on their way by an impactor. After a secondary crushing stage, the ore goes to the grinding mills where the ore minerals are liberated from the gang. These drums are of two types, and they operate in pairs, a rod mill and a ball mill. Here the ore is being tumbled with large steel rods, which reduce it to a fine powder. In both the rod and ball mills, the grinding is done in water. The process is continuous. Dry ore enters at one end and moves along the rotating drum. The product is a slurry of ore and gang particles in water. This slurry is fed to the froth flotation cells. This is where the actual separation of ore minerals from one another and from the gang takes place. Expensive chemical reagents are added to the slurry of ore, gang and water. At Pine Point, the slurry entering the cells contains the sulphide ore minerals, sphalerite and galena. It also contains the gang, limestone, calcite, dolomite and iron sulphide. 
The reagents which have been added to the slurry selectively coat particles of one of the ore minerals. In this case, it's the sphalerite. The slurry is aerated, and the coated particles stick to air bubbles that rise through the mixture. The particles of sphalerite are carried up by the bubbles into the froth at the top of the cell. The froth forms because a detergent has been added to the mixture. The process is continuous. The slurry comes in at the side and the mixture in the cells is continuously stirred and aerated. The froth carrying the sphalerite flows over the top of the cell and is channeled away for further treatment. The rest of the material in the cell is removed at the bottom. Galena is separated in other banks of flotation cells and the gang goes as waste out to the tailings pond. The tailings pond is a great shallow lake where water evaporates or drains away, leaving a vast expanse of mud and drowned vegetation. In fact, wastewater entering the tailings pond is claimed to be cleaner than the local groundwater. Two sets of flotation cells separate and concentrate the sphalerite and galena. The concentrates pass to thickening and settling tanks and are then dried by filter presses. This is the final lead sulphide concentrate, about 90 to 95% pure galena and ready for smelting. But in fact, most of the fine point lead sulphide concentrates are shipped overseas, but the zinc sulphides have a different destination. Two trainloads of concentrate leave from Pine Point every week. It was construction of the railway, sponsored and underwritten by the Canadian government in the early 1960s, that enabled Pine Point to turn from a known resource into a workable reserve. But there's no smelter at Pine Point because production from one mine alone wouldn't justify the expense. So the ore travels a thousand kilometers south to trail in British Columbia. Here it joins the products from other mines in the Cominco lead zinc smelter, one of the world's largest. The path of zinc concentrates through this works is easiest to follow. Roasting in air drives off the sulphur, and this process, like most of the plant here, is controlled very closely to ensure maximum yield and minimum risk of environmental pollution. The product leaving the roaster is leached with sulfuric acid, and the zinc goes into solution. New technology allows both sulphur removal and acid leaching to be combined in these large orange pressure vessels. But as yet, only a small percentage of the total concentrate is treated in this way. Lime is added to the zinc solution, which then goes into a large settling tank. Here the solution is checked to ensure that it has the right acidity about pH 5. It's then fed to the electro-winning plant. This hall, nearly a kilometre long, contains many tanks where the solution is electrolyzed. There are thousands of plate electrodes on which the pure zinc is deposited. All the handling and moving of the electrodes is completely automated. The complex cycle of replacing zinc-laden electrodes with fresh ones is computer controlled. Each set of electrodes sits in the solution for three days while a current of 400 amps per square meter is passed. Hydrogen gas is given off and on removal the electrodes have been covered with a layer of pure zinc.
This is melted and poured into molds. The molds are electrically heated to prevent the metal from cooling too quickly. A scum of zinc oxide forms on the surface and has to be carefully removed. The metal is 99.95% pure, compared with an original ore grade of only around 5 or 6% zinc. From trail, both zinc and lead are shipped out to customers worldwide. Sulfur removed from the concentrate is used to make sulfuric acid. So now it's mainly just water vapor that leaves the stack. Earlier operations here caused massive destruction of vegetation, but anti-pollution measures since the 1970s have resulted in regrowth on surrounding hills. And at Pine Point, Mining will continue until the last economic ore has gone and the pits are left flooded in the bush. 